Hi, Dr. Rob. Hey, Tammy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I see another a dreary day in California, which is unusual for you. It is very wet and very rainy, and uh, and that sort of suits, I think, the mood. Um, We've had sun the last two days because we had like four days of rain last week. It drove me crazy, but anyway. Yeah, no, uh, we, um, so I'll just say a little bit of thing about, and this is neither here nor there, but I like stories. So, you know, one of my neurotic challenges in life, in my adult life, has been the following. One of the things my mom was obsessed with as a child, when I was a child, was that I would go out and play. Because when the weather was nice, I don't, I think I know where you grew up, Tammy. I grew up in a similar place. The weather wasn't always nice. It would rain, it would snow, it would be gray, it would be whatever. So when the weather was nice and your parents wanted to get you out of the house, it was get outside and play. And I just got so much of that, like, and the sense I got inside of me was, if it's nice outside, I am being bad if I don't go oh. outside and play. And then as an adult, I moved to California where it's beautiful every single day. <laughs> and I feel so guilty. I look, I was like, so on days when it's raining, I feel at peace. Like there's nothing I should be doing. I it's okay to sit inside and just, you know, here I am. Oh, that's so that's funny. my neurosis for the day. Yeah. Well, you, you have a pass today, so. Mm. And you have no idea how many years I spent in therapy being able to figure that little story out. Um, so, um, we, we have, have a lot questions. Of questions today. We have, we have some questions. So for those okay. of you who, who are, have just joined us, um, this is Dr. Rob answers your questions. So if you would place your questions in the Q and A. Oh, wait um, one second. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm interrupting you. Uh, then we'll answer them most. Uh, we <laughs> typically run out of time at the end. So if you want, if you have a question that you'd like to have Dr. Rob an answer, I'd invite you to put it in sooner rather than later. I, just before we get started, you put something in the chat for me, and I want to just tell everyone what that was. I, please, yes. Yeah. So I put a link to um, the Psych Central. Dr. Rob wrote an online addiction recovery resources for use during the coronavirus-19 pandemic. So, so it's just a list of a whole lot of online resources, including those that are on sexandrelationshiphealing.com um, that you can plug into. So I wanted to make sure that anyone who gets stuck at home for any period of time can stay connected because, you know, we are very um, graced in this time to be able to just do this. And we were doing this just for convenience. Now we may be doing this for health reasons, whatever it is. I just, you know, the most important thing for me for our healing on every level is that we don't end up alone. And so what I did was, as Tammy said, every single 12-step program is on there. Um, in the rooms is on there where there's a whole bunch of other therapists. Uh, did you know Sophia Caudill was doing a support group? For, I did. Grief. Yes, we have a, go ahead. No, for grief. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, we have a friend who's just started a coronavirus group. Oh, no, I did not know she had anyone that. In a, any addict who wants to talk about that. So in the rooms has, you know, 160 12 step meetings in the rooms.com, but they also have um, some wonderful therapists like, you know, yours truly, who volunteer there and just answer questions and we're there every week. So I've noticed that they've really been, you know, environments like that are really making a difference right now when people aren't going out. So Our we, we colleague, Dr. Whole... David Fawcett, has a meeting on In the Rooms as well on Tuesday nights for chemsex. It's one of the only places where chemsex, you know, it's specifically for chemsex. It's not just for sex addiction or just for, you know, chem. So no. alcohol and sex, alcohol and relationships, cocaine and all of that. Yes, yes. Okay, so our point is, and we could talk all day about this, but then we wouldn't answer any questions that everything that Tammy and I talk about, and I think most folks who are, have spent a little time in recovery will talk about is the importance of not letting yourself feel or be alone. This is not a pull up yourself by the bootstraps moment. I don't think most days are, but right now things are a little challenging. And, you know, I think it's a really good time to remain connected with safe people. Um, I have to say there are those people I've talked to who just, well, let me tell you what I'm worried about. And, and I just thought, no, that sounds like TV. I don't want to listen to that. I just want to know the facts and then go on with my day. So do as much caregiving as you can do and then make sure you're filling yourself up with lots of connection and as I said, Tammy and I have made that available. Really, I, I published it online as a blog for anyone who's listening and does not have access. Um, Psych Central, P S Y C H Central, C N T R A L dot com is uh, where a lot of my blogs are. 
and this particular one is about the virus. Uh, my other blogs are on psychology today. Anyway, thanks, Tammy. We want to go to questions? Yes, we do. Cool. Can you talk about withdrawal? I haven't acted out in three months and I'm not having cravings or urges, but also have been fairly focused on life stressors as well as stabilization and beginning recovery. See a CSAT twice a week, workbooks, SLAA, afraid it may attack with a vengeance when the dust settles. Well, uh, and what do you think this person means about attack? What's going to attack with a vengeance? Just the the um, withdrawal, like cravings. So I'm not experiencing okay. cravings because I'm really focused on recovery. Okay. But is it going to come up and bite me? Okay, so there's two pieces to this. One is the, what we call the honeymoon, which is it's not unusual for people who get it. And you're really smart, by the way. This is a smart person because most people, it's not unusual. You go to some 12-step meetings, you go to a therapist, you find a group, you read a book, and you think, oh, wow, I feel better. This is great. I know what I'm going to be doing. And a lot of the pressure and anxiety that leads and drives the acting out goes away. And we call that kind of the honeymoon. And it's a wonderful thing in terms of, having the freedom to not feel so compelled to drink or use or sex or whatever your addiction is. The problem is, is if you get fooled into thinking that that means you've been cured because that is actually a gift to all of us. That's the time when you really need to dig in and make sure you're growing recovery relationships and you have people to call and routines for calling people so that when you are struggling again and you will be, um, those routines are in place. And, and let me say what I mean by that. Um, you know, all addicts know that one of the things they're supposed to do is reach out to people. The problem is a lot of us don't think about really doing it until we're in trouble. And then we have a lot of things to say to, to ourselves, like, oh, they must be busy, or they won't have time for me, or they won't know, you know, and, and if we're not regularly already practicing connections, we have every reason to want to avoid them when we really need them. So, um, we can't make enough friends in recovery, can really meaningful relationships in recovery. Um, there's another part of that question I want to say, oh, what is withdrawal? So let me just say what that is, and Tammy, I'm just doing me to dominate tonight. I just have some thoughts here. So I really do think I understand what withdrawal is for a sex or a porn addict, and it is an emotional state of longing. It's a, it's a sense of unfulfilled desire of, I wish I had, I wish, um, it's kind of like, even if you're in relationships, you feel distant, disconnected. And really, this is the flip side of what dopamine does when we do, when we really jack up our dopamine system, we're flooded with, oh my, and with anticipation and excitement and looking forward to things and being excited about the sex and the affairs and whatever we're going to go out and do. The opposite of that is like this kind of, oh, wow, I wish I had, and I don't have, and there's nothing, this sort of emptiness. And I think what our job is during that time is to fill that emptiness with little teeny pieces of making ourselves feel better, whether it's, you know, depending on who you are, going out and playing a ball game, getting on here, um, doing something with a friend, going to the meeting. This is also part of the learning curve is that, you know, I'm never going to feel the same way I did as I did when I was acting out on a bad day. On a bad day, like today isn't such a great day. You know, I can imagine that acting out would take me in a second to a whole other place where I could be for at least half an hour or half a day. It doesn't help me deal with reality. But if that's what it took to get through reality as an addict, it's not like my needs have changed. I just need little teeny pieces of getting the, you know, if I'm afraid, I need to touch base here. I need to call this person. I need to practice some mindfulness. I need to take some breath. I need to take a little bit of everything and bring myself to a better place. That's not the same as acting out. I will still have some anxiety and be uncomfortable, but I don't have to run away. I've put a whole bunch of pieces in place that are my foundation. And, and the longing and the I wish, and that is your body withdrawing from the drug. Yeah, and I, you know, I, and I, I agree with all of that. But what I really hear is that you're doing a lot of things to stabilize that. And so it, it, I don't know that it'll be this giant thing that comes up for you, but you, you will probably have moments. And um, 
I call them the always and nevers, you know, and where it's like, I'll never be drama queen. I'll never be able to do blah, 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 blah. And I'll always have to, you know, and like, I've learned really, you know, like just stay in the moment and, and I don't have to deal with all of that. And you're doing lots of right things. So you're here. Fantastic. But, you know, so, so you may have, well, you, I'm a hundred percent sure you'll have some niggling moments and things like that. But as long as you, you're, you're aware and you're doing things to, you know, go to another meeting, go, you know, call your sponsor, do whatever it is you need to do. Like the, the, those feelings, um, while uncomfortable, you know, are temporary, you know, you can do things to mitigate that. So, and you're doing, you know, you're here. Great. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, so I'm an SLA and other process addictions, female, about six months into recovery. I suffer from chronic depression and anxiety. I am dealing with normal life situations better, but my depression sometimes gets the best of me. I have a difficult time making myself do things and think of avoidance most of the time. It is proving difficult to deal with depression and addiction at the same time. Some days it takes all I have just to get out of bed and take care of my son. I want to ask if there is anything to beat this depression and addiction combination. Well, I mean, I, I, I know what's coming to my mind. Maybe you, do you want to start with Tammy and maybe I'll go next? I, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, things that involve medical, medical. Oh, I absolutely, I mean, there's depression, like, like, <laughs> Last week, when it was four days of rain in Arizona, I had, you know, I was absolutely on my gloomier side. That's she me. was. You know, it's, I, I, I was. It. I it's. I just don't <laughs> cope well. With, I but I know. But it's not that I can't get out of bed. So to me, this seems like you need to be seen by a qualified professional that understands addiction and depression. You know, you may need, you know, some sort of medical and Dr. Rob is way better versed at this. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, no, I'm just going to talk personally. Like I have major depression and I, I'm glad to say that there were times when, look, there are times like these last few weeks, you know, we have some, um, we have some concerns in the larger world that we're all concerned about. I'm worried about family and friends and all of that. Um, I'm distracted. I, I don't really feel well. I'm not sleeping well at night. I mean, but I don't feel I'm able to get up in the morning and get out there and do what I need to do. And right now for me, like Tammy, being active actually makes me feel better. That's how a good way I would deal with my anxiety. So, um, but I do remember being depressed and it's a different thing for me. And I just want to describe it. It's like, it's like the depression was a hole in the ground that, that I had learned, a it was like a place I could go and crawl into. It was a place I could keep safe. And even though it, I knew I was in there and I should be doing other things, it just felt like a blanket. You know, I could go to sleep, I could watch TV, I could disappear. And what medication did, because that's what I had to do, I wasn't functional. And that, you know, I wasn't where I needed to be to take care of my family, to go to work. And functionality is what you're talking about. You know, if you're not the mom you need to be to show up for these kids, I can tell you I have a lot of patients who've had depressed moms. Um, don't get yourself to a psychiatrist, get yourself on some meds so that you can stabilize. This isn't about getting high, but it's about going to some foundation place where you don't even need to crawl in bed and not feel like you want to get back out. And by the way, if you have kids, and I don't mean in any way to shame you, but I will tell you what kids go through with depressed parents is they just start, start thinking about gosh, what can I do to make mommy wake up? What can I make do to make mommy smile? You know, and that's not what you want your kids to be focused on. Um, um, yeah, depression can be fixed. And, uh, and I really, in today's world, it's not that big a deal. Take care of yourself. Well, and there's lots of meds. So, so my, and I, I'm way less versed in this than Dr. Rob, but my experience is that if you've tried something before and it didn't work, mm. don't give up. There's other other things, other doses, other medications and things like that. So, but I really do encourage someone that understands addiction, because uh, I think having that um, framework, you know, for a professional that you see is important. So let's try this, Tammy. Okay. Um, if if uh, this person writes you, Tammy at seekingintegrity.com, I have a feeling if they tell you their zip code or something, you'll be able to find them or you and I can find them a, a good psychiatrist to see. I can and we'll do be my be glad to help. And I'm Tammy. I'm a four-letter word, T-A-M-I. So. You're not. <laughs> no, everybody remembers it if I say it that way. So, yeah. <laughs> can we okay. go to the next question? Yes, please? we can. So, okay. 
Um, hi, Dr. Rob. I come from a shame-based family system and significant adverse childhood events. I'm in my late 40s and the longest sober I have had is 10 months. I find 12-step to be very punitive and the approach has a tendency to set off my shame spirals. Would you have any suggestions or resources for shame in the 12 steps or another type of recovery model? Boy, so I, you know, I do, again, I want you to, if you don't, I, I know what I'm thinking about, but I don't think it's what you're gonna to say, Tammy. So I'd love you, especially you, you have guided people in early healing into meetings and you've been person yourself. What thoughts do you have about when someone just feels like everyone in the meeting reminds them of the worst things about themselves and they don't feel comforted by that? They want to get away from them. You know what? I think that's what they're saying. Well, and, and I like I have, you, you know, there, there's things where, um, you know, come, I, I could see moments of that. I think my, my thing is I'm wondering how much of the steps you've actually done because what I found for myself was a huge relief in the 12 steps. Oh, it finally uh, broke through the shame because when I did, like, oh, huge shame. But when I did my fourth and fifth step and then you, you, as I worked through the first nine steps, the shame uh, not not 100% disappeared, but it diminished and it was very, and so I did something um, a week ago and like I was in a, I was, I was running, I was doing something healthy and I was like, oh, you're such an idiot, da, 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 da. you know, like I got into this whole thing and then I went, wait, you know, my friend Kristen Snowden has talked to me in her um, webinars about how shame is a useless, and guilt is, you know, helpful because it helps us to, but shame is, you know, this, uh, it's, it's not as a helpful thing. So, so like I was able to reframe that because I've hung around enough things, but, but I also am not carrying, you know, 50 pound bags of shame around with me anymore because I cleaned up the wreckage of my past. And so, Tammy, you said something really incredibly helpful, though, as I thought you would, which I never would have thought of, but I'll reframe it as, you know, a lot of folks don't understand that the 12-step meetings are really not a social club. They're not like a drop in and hang out and get some support and a couple of pats on the back, well, these plays, elbow bumps and leave. Yeah. They, and they're not just a place to go dump a whole lot of information and feel better. Oh, good. I'm glad I got that off my chest and people still like me. They're really a place to go to work. And all of the other things, the support, the nurturing, the validation, the connection, they're all there, but in a sense, they're all really, really there to support the work. And the work is the writing, the exercises, the self-reflection, the talking to people, pouring your heart out and crying about your, you know, your history and, and going through it with real life people. And so I agree with Tammy that, you know, if you can find someone who is safe for you or safe enough, uh, to have a cup of coffee with, to talk about this with personally, um, in some way, then it would be really helpful to talk about just just doing that piece of it, doing the work. There is something else I didn't want to bring it up immediately, but I'll just say this: that um, that depression and shame are very closely aligned, and it's not unusual for people who. And uh, I, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, and again. I want you guys to understand when I use myself in this example, I'm really not like trying to sing my own praises or tell you of that I am an example for anyone else. I'm just trying to fit in some example that might make sense and, and, and broaden it for you. Um, I mentioned earlier that I had struggled with depression and I did when someone in my family died and I just really, really struggled for a while and I had to go on medication. And it really helped me, as I was explaining earlier, um, being depressed is kind of like, being able to crawl into a hole in the ground. It, you, it's your hole, it's got your name on it. It, 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 it fits your body perfectly, you know? And, and going on an antidepressant was the weirdest thing because I did all the same things. I still kept exercising and eating, going to therapy, but taking that medication, all of a sudden that hole in the ground disappeared. I kept looking for it like, oh, I just want to get back in there and crawl under the, and I just couldn't. It was like, it was like I was on the first floor. I wasn't in the basement anymore and I hadn't really done anything, but it helped a lot. That's what it was like, but, the other part that it did for me personally, and I think for some of us addicts, it's really helpful is I'm often a person who will take things a little personally or react like, why did you say that to me in that way? Or I can be a narcissistic, some of you know this. And part of that means really reacting to things that really aren't personal. They're really not meant about me. And if I just thought through it, I would probably see that. 
And one of the things for many of us that an antidepressant can do, and no, Tammy and I don't make any money selling medications <laughs> at all, um, but one of the things they can do is kind of give, well, they did for me, was, and many people I've worked with, was when I felt like something bothered me, like if Tammy said, you know, I don't want you wearing any more hoodies on the show. I think you really need to dress a little bit better, Dr. Rob. Instead of saying, well, screw you, Tammy, I don't give a shit what you think because what I want to wear is what I want to wear, which might have been something I could have said in the past on the wrong day. Um, not Hopefully not in that way, but still. Instead, I can take a moment and say, huh, oh, I bet she didn't mean that I look bad or that I did anything wrong or that she's just thinking about how well we want to present ourselves. And I have that moment and antidepressants can do this, that moment to not take things personally, to not feel ashamed, to not collapse into myself and into my shame, which can look like depression. And so I'm also offering that that may be another, you may also want to go see a doc and get a medication evaluation because you want to go on those meetings and feel connected, not disconnected. And I, I'm also curious, so I put a link because uh, our dear friend, Charlie Rizian, uh, was gracious to go through her, uh, her really unpacking what the 12 steps are, because it really is, you know, doing the work, you know, that the 12 step program is, it's it, you know, warming a chair is great, connecting it's and all It's hours that of stuff. stuff. But it is, yeah, she, she did um, all 12 steps and she went word by word. And I've been around a long time. I've, I've said those, I can quote them from memory, but, you know, to unpack it and have her share that was really meaningful for me. So I, I really appreciated that. Um, but I, I was also thinking about, you know, like Dr. Rob just said, you know, Tammy, you know, what do you mean by the hoodie thing or whatever? You know, I think one of the things, if you're getting triggered by people, you know, it would be okay to go up to someone and say, when you said that, what did you mean? Or, you know, here's what I felt like I heard or whatever. Like, have the conversation. If it's something in the readings, I would invite you to dig in and, and look into it more and find out what the meaning is behind it. Because trust me, all that stuff has been, you know, analyzed a zillion different ways. And, and uh, it isn't meant to make us shameful. It's to help us work past the shame and, uh, you know, be connected and, and and not have to be triggered and use again, so. Um, something about uh, the 12-step thing you said is up there on YouTube. We're, by the way, we're working on developing a, a Seeking Integrity, I think is what we'll call it, YouTube channel, because we have so many hours of different people talking and educating. And, and I do want to go back on Charlie Rizian's, um, so I think it's something like six hours that the two of you recorded, maybe more. I think and it's you, more, but yeah. And, and what they did was they in very great detail went through each of the 12 steps and what its purpose is and how it's used. And, you know, Tammy's a pretty wise person. I would definitely give you, a, you know, three checks then. But I would say that Charlie gets four or five checks on the wisdom scale. She's uh, a woman who's probably nearly, can I say she's probably nearly 80? No, and, she's not that old. And has such an amazing recovery story. And the, her spirituality is very profound. Anyway, I asked her if she would please take the time. She did this for free. And if you want to do the work and get the insight, but with a little bit of saucy love on the side, I assume you guys had some fun doing we that. We had, we, I, I, um, she's a delight, so yes. Um, and there, of course, you know, again, we don't charge for any of this. This is all service. I try to cat, grab a friend who's, you know, I think is amazing and say, can I record you? Can we get, you know, all of that? And, and by the way, let me just say maybe a little, maybe a little time out. Um, we have a podcast. It's called Sex, Love, and Addiction. And the reason I mention it, it's not just a vanity podcast. That's what we call them out here in Hollywood, vanity podcasts. <laughs> I'm a chiropractor and I have a podcast, no offense to chiropractors. Yeah. Um, but this is a little bit more than that. We've had, oh my God, we're getting, I won't say close to half a million downloads, but it, it would not too long, probably during this, we're over three or 400,000. You were more at 335,000 when I checked uh, last week, so. And um, so it just means that a lot of people are finding the things we're saying useful. And it's not me and Tammy at that much, although we do show up. It's me with a whole bunch of professionals who you might not have heard their names, but if you run around and go to conferences for psychotherapy and addiction and, and uh, um, infidelity and um, sexuality, you would run into all these people. And since I speak at a lot of conferences, they were willing to go on the podcast. So if you're interested in sex, love, and, lo sex, love, and addiction, it's another thing we give away for free. And as Tammy said, there's a 
gay version, there's a sex, love, and addiction, the gay podcast with Dr. David Fawcett, who talks about uh, LGBTQ issues um, in recovery and all of that. So um, questions, questions. Yes, we have, questions. We have more questions. So uh, this one, this is going to be interesting for you. How long do you suspect everything will be closed due to the pandemic? Well, I guess it depends on what every, what do you mean by everything? And, uh, it, it, right. So I think, um, so I think grocery stores will be open and I think that pharmacies will remain open and I think all important services like medical care will be open. Um, I think that it will be um, three or four weeks before any of us are going to the movies or the mall. Um, because this isn't just what happens in one part of the country, what's happening in one place well, it may be happening in another place a week later. And so there are going to be some global rules and then there are going to be some regional rules. So some places may get more freedom quicker. Like if you notice um, in China, there's a lot more freedom and a lot of freedom from the virus because for a while they really clamped down. So, but they clamped down in parts of the country, not everywhere in the same way. So there'll be parts of the country that will get closed down and be very shut down. Other parts that will open up and it'll be kind of like a, you know, on the freeways here in California, and I bet in Arizona, they call it a um, um, an inchworm. It'll be kind of like an inchworm. Um, but I think that this is going to be an opportunity for a lot of gratitude to be um, able to connect online like this for everything, for emergencies, with, for grandchildren. You know, um, believe me, every boomer I've ever met is now going to finally get tech savvy. <laughs> um, I think that we're in for a difficult time and there's no way around that. And I'm just so grateful that I'm not alone uh, in going through this and that none of you are tonight. So the next question, is it normal to feel imprisoned when your spouse tries to set boundaries to keep one from getting triggered and acting out? Those, so there's two questions in there and I wanna to try to pull them apart. Um, it's not at your spouse's job to um, make your life to put um, to kind of throw um, tax in your way so that you don't go end up going down that path or this one it's not her job to um, try to so you may now there's a couple issues here you may feel that she's doing that and she may not be so there's a couple of things there's your wife's boundaries and her boundaries may be I want you home at this time of day I don't want you looking at porn I want to be able to check on your phone and see where you are. Um, I want to check and see who you've talked to. Those are not there to imprison you. Those things are there so that she can begin to feel safe and decide whether to love you or kick your butt out. So she is trying to find out what's true and what isn't. And since you, since you have been lying to her, her setting what we would call boundaries, meaning I want to know this, I want to know that, I want to see this, I want to see that, is simply her really trying to still work it out with you on some level because trust me um, if she didn't want to work it out with you she wouldn't give a poop what was on your phone she'd be out the door but the other piece is that what keeps you sane and sober what keeps you from going to porn or anonymous sex or affairs that really isn't anything your wife can help you with you have to figure out who is the friend, what is the group, where is the support, what is the writing. And it's fine to tell your wife what's working and what isn't, but it's not her job to set that up for you. So, you know, I, I feel like there's some couples issues here. This is a lot of reason why I think a one or two couple sessions, not like a whole lot in the beginning, but one or two couple sessions. You know, Tammy, I've actually said this, I'm gonna take some credit for this. People have said, is there any place for couples therapy in the beginning of this work after some spouse has found out a lot. And I don't think there's really room for, for deep, meaningful couples therapy, but I do think, and this is the point that's being made here, in the beginning, it's important for you guys to be able to set boundaries. And are they controlling me? No, they're just taking care of themselves. Like, which one of those is it? It takes, a, it'd be nice to have somebody there to say, actually, she does get to ask for that. Or you know what? You do get to go to your sponsor for that because you may not have those answers. And for that, a really skilled couples person in this arena would really be helpful to you in the beginning, I think. That or 
you know, a, someone who really understands how to sponsor you guys. Um, Tammy, do you have any other thoughts for that? It's a great question. I do. The, it's actually on the goals for the Couples Healing from Betrayal workshop. And so I just put the link for Can that. Can you slow down a little bit? Sometimes you say that really fast and I'm like, do. they do not have any idea what you're talking about. So. My husband says the same thing, that I talk really fast. No, I, I do too. I know. I just, you talk faster than me sometimes. That's what oh. you think. Okay. <laughs> We both talk. But anyway, we let me have take a breath. Yes, I put a link in for the couples healing from betrayal workshop, and one of the I, I, on that link you'll see the goals, which includes um, uh, communication skills. Um, but it, it talks about establishing and implementing healthy boundaries, and that's right. for both of you, or and for the relationship. So, um, is is a great workshop. It's limited to four couples. Happy to give and everybody information. And it's on hold so. till April. So or may i think is the next one so we're on viral hold until may so you know but i i think what tammy's saying also um there are meetings called recovering couples anonymous and i think part of what i'm hearing tammy say or i want to read into this is that it's if you are a couple and you can get around other couples who are dealing with this like for example tammy do we have any groups online that are for couples together to come and ask questions and kind of like to get, you know what I mean? Yes, and I, I think the various webinars are great. I think John Taylor's Rock and Relationships is, we don't have any drop-in groups for couples yet. We now, might talk about that, yeah. No, but okay. we have, but I haven't figured out who would do it and how we would I might want moderate to do that. it. Well, you could do that, so we can talk. But then you'd but, have to do it too, because we'd have to be a fake couple. <laughs> oh, well, we right, basically we'll are. Later. But anyway, but but yeah, John Taylor's, Eddie Caparucci's, Kristen Snowden's, there's lots of webinars that are really good for couples, you know, and mm -hmm. has content that you know, um, I, Troy loves, you know, so honestly, there's a lot of content on there and check out the previously recorded webinars that are on the site too, you'll find, um, you know, you'll find a lot of that. Uh, stuff there. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to just riff off that for one more second. I, and this is really for everybody. Um, when we do a particular podcast, we never know which one's going to have meaning to you. But if you guys are riding in a car, if you guys are, or one of you says, you know, I wish my husband could hear that. I mean, that's why we did this. I mean, there's a great, one of my favorite podcasts is with this gentleman by the name of Stan Tatkin. I love that one. Yeah. T -A -T, and he talks about the meaning of relationships and why we, and I, if I was either a member of a couple, I would want to like hear that with my partner because it really helps explain boundaries and what, what a relationship is really for other than taking care of our kids and money. So, and that um, isn't even just about addiction. That's, I, I'm going to have to change right. my plans, but, but that one's a just, I've told any couple. Yeah, I think can you, you look like you're being grilled. I know on I do, so. You look yeah. like you're on a detective show. Or, I know. Okay, now it's all different. Yeah, I'm going to, I'll change the blinds in a second. So you ready for the next question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What should the spouse expect when their partner is at Seeking Integrity Los Angeles? That's a great question. And I'll check my blinds. Okay, I don't know. Um, so there are different ways to look at this. One would be what does a spouse expect from, um, how do I explain this? Let me, let, me back, let me go a little bit further back. Um, so first of all, when I look at a couple where one person is an addict and they've been actively acting out and the partner is not been acting out, but maybe they haven't known or they've been compensating or they've been hanging in there or whatever, I really don't look at the partner as having as being sick. I don't look at the partner as having um, a problem with addiction. I more look at the partner as having been just in a long-term stressful crisis that just never seemed to end. <laughs> or maybe they've just started down the road of being in a long stressful crisis, it seems like. But what you guys is different, what you all need as partners is different from the addicts. You all need a lot of support, a lot of guidance, a lot of education, a lot of validation, um, a lot of reasons to stay or go or whatever works for you. You need help learning the truth. But none of those things really require you to be in residential treatment. You're not out of, and, and, we, and this deal is, we have residential treatment. The reason we run Seeking Integrity is when someone's behavior is so out of control or their life has left them so out of control, like the results of their behavior, that they don't have anywhere else to go. <laughs> or they don't know how to stop, you know, all of that. So um, the addicts really do need a lot of containment, a lot of structure, a lot of education, a lot of confrontation, um, a lot of new behaviors. They need to learn a whole different way of living. And, and so they really do need, if they're struggling that much, residential treatment. I, I hope that what partners get as a result of 
an addict being in residential treatment with us or anyone is whatever you need from it. In other words, you want a twice a week report on how it's going, or you want to check in with him or the therapist, or it's kind of like your husband or wife is in the hospital. You're not in the hospital. You don't need the same treatment. So no, we're not going to be treating you in the same way. You don't have the same illness. Um, on the other hand, we want to keep you involved and give you hope and let you know what's going on. So you can express, expect sessions with your partner. You can expect to meet with a couple's therapist or, or have someone on your side there. You can expect to have a really clear plan written in writing for what this person you, that you love is supposed to do when they leave, you know, uh, they need to, um, and oftentimes that will be run around with you before they leave. Um, it's not unusual for you to have input on whether you want them to stay longer or how long you want them to stay. Um, also, there's one more thing. Tammy, would you explain the impact letter or do you want me to explain that? Well, I, I was going to say when, um, after someone is registered, we actually have a partner expectations letter that I email to you know, each of them um, so that they have that information. It's a letter basically from Dr. Rob. We've added some details like, you know, when, the, you know, when your loved one reaches the airport, this is what will happen. Um, but yeah, we do, you know, we do ask that each partner provide, if they are willing, a letter of how the addiction and their loved one's behavior has impacted them. And, you know, that, and that is shared in the treatment. And we process. use that in treatment. Yes. And yes. so what, what I'm saying to you is it's not just, um, I don't think there's a reason for you to be present with us. You're not the one who needs the chemo, so to speak, but I want your voice present. I want your experience present. And I, and we're always here to check in with and talk to, and you will see what the plan is for this patient, your spouse coming home. You know, I want to say to everybody in here, and I don't know how many folks are going to find out right now. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you that, you know, Sam, Tammy will often say to me that I say things that people don't want to hear or they don't like to hear. It's not that I'm wrong. It's just that not everyone's asking me to say it, but I'm going to, you know, around the issues that we treat, the, these issues that I have treated for 25 years and written nine books about, I just want to be really clear with everyone in the room. Um, in case you're not clear, those of us who are addicts and struggle with sex and porn and love addiction um, and all the related issues, we have emotional problems. You know, we don't come to this just because it's like just an addiction and the addiction will get cured. There's a lot of stuff underneath that. We are people with a lot of issues. And whether we present them on, you know, oftentimes we don't present them up front. We look pretty good up front. Maybe some of you married us or married that person. And here you are six or 12 years later realizing how broken we are. And I am so sorry that we have been able to hide that from you for so long. I hope you still love the parts of us that you see as whole. And we're, our job is to help make the whole of us whole, which means you're going to have to see the ugly parts that we've been hiding for a long time. So I'm speaking in like therapy and different kind of languages to just give you a sense of what this is all about. Um, so anything else for that, Tim? Well, you just shared that you're going to have to see the ugly parts and that terrifies us that terrifies us that you're going to see those ugly parts. Uh, uh, it terrifies the addict that you're going to see the yeah. ugly parts, but what terrifies the spouse is only one thing, the unknown. Right. And so every time we say, oh, I don't want the spouse to see this part because then they'd really hate me, but then they find out a little bit later or that's, that's their worst nightmare is that they can never just figure out what has happened. And that is why in uh, long-term work, disclosure is done so the spouse who wants to stay does get an opportunity to understand what's happened um, but anyway we're getting ahead of ourselves we have yes. a lot of questions we've so got a lot of we... questions we're gonna run out of time um, I've been working with a CSAT my sponsor and a lot with my wife we have discovered that I'm a narcissist and that I always <laughs> right I'm thinking this is contributing to my inability to stop lying what are your thoughts and are there some real steps I can start to take to, uh, to make a change thanks for being there for us well, I, you know, I can tend toward the sarcastic. So I kind of want to say, keep coming back. You know, um, you are on the, so if I had to say in psychological terms, what AA has done 
It's given a place for narcissistic people to learn how to get along with other people and work through their selfishness and find a path to empathy and then a path to giving, none of which are native to us. I know that Tammy would rather sit in a bar and drink and I would rather have sex with lots of people than be sitting here helping you. But actually this is a lot more rewarding in the long run I've discovered. But as an active addict, I didn't know that. I just thought uh, the world revolved around me. So. And to be an active addict means, and I want you to understand this, look, narcissism is endemic, meaning it is without question engaged when you're an addict. Addicts are narcissistic by nature. My best example, I use it often, is the man who is a heroin addict and he will use his kid's college fund to get to those drugs. But three years later when he gets sober, most of the men who are that guy will work three jobs to pay that college fund back because they don't want to be that guy that took a penny out of their kid's pocket. So narcissism takes over when you're an addict because narcissism means I come first, what I want comes first, you come second, or you don't matter. And that's what addiction means. So now, when people stop acting out as active addicts, it doesn't mean that the traits of narcissism go away right away. Um, this is why a lot of spouses, and Tammy will affirm this, come here and they say, I don't understand it. My husband or my, my spouse has been going to meetings and it's been a year and they've been going to therapy and they're still a jerk. You know, don't they say that all the time? Yeah. And it's like, because I can learn to stop acting out. I can learn to have some understanding of how it's affected you. I can learn to understand how vulnerable I really have always been and maybe even how I got vulnerable and work on it. But learning to be a more in the moment, compassionate, um, aware person of other people's needs, that takes years uh, and a lot of determined work. Here's the deal. Um, I know this is from a therapy school. Um, when we go to therapy school, Tammy, this is something you didn't know. They tell us the likelihood of how likely any particular person with any particular kind of issue is to come to treatment. In other words, how likely is a depressed person to come to therapy? Very high, like 70% if they're really mm, struggling. Okay. How likely is it that an addict will come in? Very high if they're really, but someone who's narcissistic, they don't come into treatment because they don't even have the capacity to really understand that they are the problem. So they wouldn't show up in treatment for themselves. They might come into couples therapy, but they are fine. So. Here's one of the gifts of addiction. It, it, it really allows narcissists to have to take a look at themselves in, the way, in a way that some people who aren't addicts but have these kinds of traits don't. So I would suggest to you, working on the steps, I would do exactly what Tammy said. You should be on that ride listening to um, those 12 steps and working on that. And really good psychotherapy in group, not individual. Because in individual, we can pull all kinds of games with our therapist. But to, I'll tell you what, the best work I ever did on my narcissism was sitting in group therapy for three years where people had to call me on my bullshit. And I was like, oh my God, I just wanted to curl up in a ball because I felt so awful and I hated myself because they saw me. and they. But, but I got through that and realized it was bullshit and learned how to connect with them. You know, But it takes time and a, and a lot of being gentle with yourself um, so anyway, that, that's what I have to throw at that. I, and I, I love all of that. My extra thought on that is um, rather than react, uh, to take a pause and, th and th think it through. Do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? And that one worked really well for me because I, you know, can want to be right. And uh, at no. the end of the day, I want, you know, like, what is that going to show if I just am constantly pounding that I'm right um, and I'm not always right um, but I would rather be tell me more about your point of view and and that's helped me a lot but it sounds like you're in fairly early recovery that's my suspicion just from this but yes keep keep coming back do the work I love Dr. Rob's suggestion about group um, you know I mean that's at Seeking Integrity which is still open um, we uh, oh, we're doing fine yeah we do a lot of group work and that's really where you know the, I think that's really where things change uh, uh, um, I do want to say one more thing because everyone's really hip to this word narcissist especially spouses so it's worth taking a moment I have been I really want you guys to hear this I have been a clinical um, educator and a licensed therapist for 25 years. It is this year, 25 years, I've had a license in California. That's a long time to have a license. Like, And then you have to go to school before that. And I got a PhD after. I know a few things. And I've also seen 
well over a thousand people, whether it's individuals or groups or in all kinds of situations doing this work, assessments, evaluations, all of it. And I can tell I can really count on these two hands the number of truly narcissistic personality disorders that I have met. Um, and I would say about this, maybe just a few more for a borderline personality disorder. In other words, people have all kinds of traits of what I would vulnerabilities that we show, you know, when I'm anxious, when I'm angry, I can not give a shit about you and I'm going to honk my horn and, you know, but when I'm, a, when I'm in a good space, I would never want to disturb you, you know, and, and some people are able to think ahead and not honk that horn and some people when they're anxious, they're not. And so when under stress, we can be more narcissistic, more demanding. We used to turn to drugs or sex or whatever to feel better about that. Dealing with your own needfulness and narcissism is a part of recovery. It's not one we talk about openly um, when we say, go work the steps and go to meetings. But really, we are talking about a lot of recovery from self-obsession. It's all throughout the literature of, of the 12 steps. I did want to hold up this little book that when I'm having a bad day, I try, try to remember to read. Um, and it's not even that it's such a great book. It's just what the title is because Tammy and I, well, more me than Tammy now, I tend to want to say something that's really right on the top of my mind. And, and that always isn't the best thing to say. It feels really good in the moment. I have to say, anyway, let's move on. We have more and it's the next one has narcissistic. I know and I'm hungry. It's almost dinner time. Well, we've got lots. So, um, I read about narcissistic parents and the effect they have on sex addicts. I'm sure my parents were, which pushed me to an overachiever in certain areas of my life. In addition, I developed, I'm going to slow down. In addition, um, I developed this sense of things are never good enough or I want more or never satisfied. Are these events or actions that set the stage for my sex addiction? Um, so I, I'd be curious just to say what this person read, what they're referring to by they've learned. Like, is that something you heard in a 12-step meeting or meaning that, that you're dead on that uh, uh, for men in particular, um, there are forms of us having to give ourselves up emotionally to care for our caregivers. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I have stories of my own, but, but I think a more famous one, like Tiger Woods would, if you read his books, you know, I don't know if he's a sex addict or not. I've never met him, never been in treatment with him. That's true. But when you read his Tiger Woods story, you know, this was a guy whose father wouldn't look at him if he had a bad golf swing that day. I mean, everything depended on him doing it right. Now, that may have resulted in an amazing golfer, or maybe he would have gotten there another way. But what's more important is that that's a child who learned he was only worthy of his father's love when he did what his dad wanted. And, you know, that wasn't a kid who got picked up and cuddled when he had a bad swing. And so in that way, all the way to people like me, I had a mentally ill mom. She turned to me to figure out what she was going to do next, you know, when I was four. But that was my job, you know. So but in every way, for m most of the men I work with, there has been some early uh, disruption in dependency on a caregiver that leaves us feeling more grandiose, more important than we really are. Because, you know, think about this, by the way, narcissism comes from, and it, problematic narcissism in adult life in part comes from a child learning to believe that they're more important than they really are. Like for my mom, um, I, she so depended on me emotionally that I think I felt like I was a grown up when I was four. But really, how much control did I have over my mom? Probably not a lot when I was four, but she made me feel like, uh, she needed me for everything. And, and that kind of sense of, wow, I must be really important. I'm more important than, you know, mommy is, or mommy can't do anything without me is really, that's, those are the seeds of the grandiosity that leads to later narcissism. Um, the other piece is the unmet needs of the child who's so busy attending to mom or dad that, that there's nothing going on for them. And they don't learn to play. They don't learn to be creative. They don't learn to just hang out and have fun because life is about doing things or pleasing others not necessarily about figuring out what you need or you want and then when you feel really empty you go grab what you need or want over there somewhere you drink it you smoke it you whatever so and i just want to point out when people call looking for help you know i, I talk about this is the the underlying stuff this 
is what we address in treatment. We're looking to help with all of those things. So, you know, that like Dr. Rob just said, you know, I, I did all these things to try to soothe myself or, you know, escape or whatever, but it's those underlying things. So I invite you to get great help to, to uh, address those things. Well, I want to say something about, you know, um, being mature as a treatment place. I just want to say, I just realized this, Tammy, and this is going to sound really snooty. So is it okay if I sound, how many people are here? Okay, I'll sound a little snooty. Like I've been doing this work a really long time and like recently we've had a couple of folks here and there who over the last six months, four months, who just, they were so preoccupied with their own issues that they really couldn't focus on treatment. Either they were so angry or they were so depressed or they were so, you know, whatever the issue was. And God bless those folks, you know, I really wish them well, but I want in the environment we're working in for people to be really ready to do the work because that's how, what I'm, we can, you know, being, I think working at this level of expertise and maybe that's some of what people hear. I don't know. Maybe here people here just blah, 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 blah. But if you hear anything in here that's useful, like this isn't how average therapists talk. This isn't like when you hear sexual issues and early attachment and trauma and childhood and mental health and medication. And we're thinking in very high level in the work that we're doing. And in a way I feel Tammy, like, that's the level I want to aspire to with our clients. There's always, there's a million places I think for people to go when they're just like, uh, they're going because somebody made them do it. Um, but I'm really interested in working with folks who want to change their lives, you know, and I think that's what's inspiring to me about it. Um, but I guess I'm being a little arrogant. You know, I should want to work with everybody. Not, but I work with everybody no, else for no, years. You, you work with with the people that come, and many of them do get to that place where they get it and want to, even if they come a little reluctantly because they're mostly doing it for someone else. Many of them. Oh, well, that's okay. As yeah, long as you're curious, it. as long yes. as you wonder, as long as you're not just saying, I have no part in this, it's all their fault that I'm here because they made me come. That's just, you know, I can't really do a lot for anyone in that situation. None of us can. <laughs> but you might go to therapy and your your spouse thinks, oh, at least they're going to therapy and you know that you're just bullshitting them. That happens. So we have a couple more and we started a few minutes late, so I'm going to hold you to that. Oh. So, uh, no, stop whining. Okay. Um, thanks, Dr. Rob. You are helping from December, escaping a destructive relationship. Thank you for your wisdom and effort. My question is, I am an empathetic person and is it possible to take over and feel someone else's emotions? Lately, I have had overwhelming feelings and sometimes I wonder if they are even mine. How can I know or deal with this? What is mine and what is not mine to deal with? Um, wow. Well, so that's almost not clear for me to be quite able to respond to. Um, because I don't know if this is an addict, because I think I know how addicts think of this as a partner. I think it's a partner. Um, let me ask you this. Um, I would actually rather ask, answer that offline because I want to give that some thought. There's another question I saw, if you wouldn't mind answering, and I promise we will respond to that one. Okay. Um, there's a question about um, someone who says they're teaching at a university. Can you oh, read that? I can, but you got to promise to do some of the other ones too. Cause... I will go back okay. to it. I okay. Um, I teach at a university. I'm coming to terms with the fact that we will be online for the foreseeable future. I rely a lot on my students and my colleagues for social interaction. I'm a single woman in SLAA. I'm feeling really anxious about the isolation and feel like these are right conditions for acting out and relapsing, which I don't want to do. This is just really tough, especially if face-to-face -face meeting go away. How do I get through this feeling really gloomy today? So I, I just wanted to say two things. One, I think everybody's feeling a little gloomy today and um, maybe for a little while. But also, Tammy, I was thinking that you might send that person the, the blog that we put up. Maybe they didn't hear that. That, you know, we have 14 meetings a week for people to connect. In the Rooms has 160 12-step meetings and probably eight or 10 therapy meetings. And listen, um, um, I know that this doesn't replace hugs and connection of face-to-face -face meetings, but I, I, I try to be... I really try to be in gratitude and I just think how like when I was growing up I had a TV in my room it only had three channels it was answering certain hours of the day and mostly it had this woo thing at night with it nothing on after midnight we can connect all over the world any time of day and 
and I understand your loneliness and fear, I would just lean into the fact that here we are right now, and in an hour there'll be something else and something else and somewhere else. And that's why I put that blog up to let everyone know that this is not the end of connection. It's just a time out from hugs and kisses and the closeness that we all want. By the way, I will say as a reminder to all the sex addicts in the room, um, um, what's happening in the world, um, a contagious virus that is highly contagious is a really good opportunity to think about um, what you want to, how you want to be in the world. And do you want to go out there and share something or do you want to give something? Do you want to, um, I can't think of, you know, I remember Tammy, the rooms of 12 step meetings were very full in the nineties because people were fearful of getting HIV. And um, I hope that these rooms are full because you guys and ladies don't want to go out there and bring something home to your family that you don't even know you have. So this is a great fear faith moment, fear faith. You know, can I put my faith in healing? Can I leave my fear behind? Um, did you want to answer that? You want me to answer well, that I, last well I want to answer, I want to tag on to what you just said. So there's a female sex and love addict group on Tuesday nights online. And it, you know, it's a small group. I've subbed in on it a couple times. You know, I'd invite you to, you know, to join that particular you know, and, specifically meeting too. So. And in the rooms has an SLAA meeting every week too. I know they do. Um, yeah. So I listened to your podcast with Eddie Caparucci and I ordered this book right away. I realized my addiction has everything to do with my childhood trauma, chaotic alcoholic house. I see an ASAT every week for my addiction, but I'm wondering if he will be able to help me deal with childhood trauma or if I should look for a dedicated trauma therapist. I'm also looking into EMDR. Advice? Um, Tammy, am I correct in that an ASAT is the, um, it's the lower the, level. So a CSAT, you have to have a yeah, certain amount of credentials and ASAT is, uh, hasn't right. achieved, um, doesn't have a master's, doesn't have, there's something different. Right. So this is a good question to ask. And, 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 um, um, I can be very quick cause not everyone knows what these letters mean or, or if they're even important, but, um, not every CSAT knows how to do trauma work. So, um, what I would do with your ASAT is really get your sobriety in order, really get your recovery in order. They are really good at doing the here and now, the, you know, stay out of the trauma work because they're not really trained for it. What you might do is look for a trauma therapist. And if you have the resources, you could see your ASAT maybe once a week or, I mean, sorry, once a month, just to stay connected to the recovery piece because that's really their job. And then look um, more at the trauma work with people who really do trauma work. By the way, I want to say quickly, what is trauma work? Everyone seems to think like, you know, this trauma work is not, is not, I promise. I have this big bubble of trauma inside me and I'm going to do some therapy and it's going to pop open and all the yucky stuff's going to come out and then I'm going to be better. That's not really what trauma work is. I think people have misconceptions about what it is. It's really about discovering the ways that trauma has affected your current life or is affecting it and finding new ways to become aware of that and go around it. You know, for me, sexual acting out is a result of trauma. One of the ways that has helped me to go around it is understanding that it comes from trauma. I don't hate myself about sex addiction because I understand what I went through and survived. So in any case, I just, um, trauma work is not about lancing the boil. It's not about, I'll go 12 sessions and I'll fix things. For some things that are very um, panicky, very uh, hype, uh, Tammy, you can help me with this. There are certain kinds of trauma therapy like EMDR that are good for people who have flashbacks or they have like very immediate, the trauma is very immediate, like a PTSD kind of situation. But for most of us who have long-term trauma, we're fearful of intimacy, we struggle with sex, we want to tell lies and keep secrets, we live a double life, you know, we have narcissism and other social challenges, that's long-term work. And we just conquer the mountains one at a time. It's like, you know, I'll stop with this. Tammy, you know, um, I, do you remember, I know you do, these old exercise bikes in the gym, like in the 80s or 90s when they first had the graphics, and you'd go over a little hill, like you'd go over a little bumpy hill, and then you'd go over a big hill, and then you go over a little, and it was mm -hmm. really yes. stupid. Um, that's kind of what it's like, you know, this process is about, you're going to, you know, you're going along like a little Mario Brothers character, and you're going to run into that hill, and it's not just your addiction you're working with. It's the whole thing. It's your ability to connect. It's your ability to get love. It's what you have to give. Every step in this process is additive. So um, thank you, Tammy, for taking the time tonight. And for those of you that didn't get your questions answered, and I'm sorry, 
but please email, I, join us again or Dr. David on Wednesday night or um, email. We're happy to, I'm happy to, I get emails and questions all the time. I'm happy to give as many resources as I, as I can, so. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Dr. Evening. Rob. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Guys. See you next um, week. By the way, this is Tammy yeah. at SeekingIntegrity.com. I'm Rob at SeekingIntegrity.com. That's how you find us. Have yeah. a great well, evening. Yeah. Bye. Go to the website and you'll, you'll find me. Bye right. for now, Thanks. guys. Bye.